Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Glad to see everybody out this morning. Glad everybody remembered to change their clocks and got up nice and early. I don't know about you, but like 8 o'clock rolled around, and I was laying there like, Lord, hell, is 11 o'clock ever going to get here? It, uh, it messed me up. But no, we're certainly glad you're here this morning. Glad you're uh, here with us at Pleasant Grove. And hope you just feel at home. We hope that we don't have visitors here, um, but nothing but family. But will you uh, just join me in going to the Lord in prayer this morning? Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you, we just, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. God, we thank you, Lord, for just, Lord, just the ability to come and, Lord, to call upon your name. God, Lord, to worship you, to praise you. God, Lord, to, to take all our cares, Lord, to take all our worries. And, Lord, just place them at the foot of the cross this morning. We thank you for that opportunity. Lord, we just pray that you'd be with us in our services this morning, that you would just do great and mighty things. Lord, that you'd touch every heart, every mind here. Lord, that you just speak to us, Lord, as, as you see fit. So, Lord, we just love you this morning, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I do have just a few quick announcements we want to go through this morning um, as we uh, open up. Um, the youth is doing a fundraiser for our winter retreat, and so we have just a short video that we'd like to show you this morning about that fundraiser. Rada kind of sells itself. It's one of those products that people know. I don't ever have to question if the knife's going to be in good condition or if it's going to be in good shape. I think they're very sturdy, especially for their price point and their value. The knives stay sharp for a really long time before I have to use my knife sharpener. Just the quality of the products in general, I just can't find anything to beat it. They're just wonderful. What you get for what you pay from Rada is far none better than anything else. The quality plus the um, craftsmanship is really important. Someone gave us a paring knife that was from Rada. We found some vendors and we decided that let's fill our drawers with knives that actually cut and work and stay sharp. Amen. So if you haven't already got hit up, I know it's coming, so I just want to go ahead and warn you, the youth is selling Rate of cutlery for our youth uh, winter retreat. All proceeds will go towards covering the cost of their trips. If you do not have any rate of knives or kitchen utensils or anything like that, um, you need some. We were given a small set uh, when we got married, and I think those are like the only two knives that ever get used in our house because they are so much better than everything else we have. So you can see any of the youth that's going on the trip. Everybody should have a catalog, or you can get their online link. Um, the only difference is if you order online, then it's shipped directly to you as soon as you order. If you order from the catalog, then, of course, um, it'll be about mid-December before you receive those because we'll have to process everything and all that good stuff. So see any of our youth to buy Rada, or you can see us. We do have just a general link. Um, that you can find on all our social media platforms to, to get us started. So uh, uh, just make sure you support them in doing that. And if you are youth, middle school, and high school, and you're not planning on going on our winter retreat, you need to sign up. You need to go. We're going up to Gatlinburg for three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and uh, got a huge cabin, going to have a great time, and uh, just going to have just 
Come Together Weekend. That's what we're calling it. Come Together. All about coming together as one group. So with that being said, if I can get everybody to stand back to your feet this morning. Like I said, again, we're just so very glad you're here, and we just want to give you the opportunity to uh, fellowship, say hello to everybody. If you're a first-time guest with us this morning, make sure you go back in uh, our guest information booth so we can just get a little information about you, get to know you, and uh, present you with a small gift. But just take some time this morning, just fellowship uh, with each and everyone here. Still not passing, passing plates. We have boxes at the doors to, to drop your offering in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in victory you do reign, Father. 
And Father, we just thank you for bringing us together here today and, and just bless this offering to further your kingdom, Father. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've come to that time during our worship service where we take our offering. And because you're not here physically, we wanted to offer you an opportunity to be able to give online. Like every other house of worship, we depend on uh, tithes and offerings to continue ministry. And there will be a lot of ministry in the days to come. You can go to www.theplaceofhope.com and tithe online. Just click the Give Online button and it'll take you directly to our Easy Tithe bridge so that you can give and continue to be generous during this time of need. Have a great day. I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Sing it with me, you know this one. Waiting for change to come and knowing the battles won. For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still.
Glad to be here this morning. Say amen. Would you do that? Amen. I want to introduce someone to you very quickly. She doesn't know I'm going to do this, but Malia McCall, are you in here? I think you are. I saw you come in. I don't know where you're seated. Come right here with me, sweetheart. Malia, it's funny. I said Malia's there. Everybody started laughing. What was that all about, Malia? Let me tell you something. I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. This truck girl right here is 11 years old, smart as a whip. Then I found out that she was inducted into the beta club at her school. She did not get that from her daddy. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that. <laughs> it's got to be the mama side. Is that right? Yeah, it's got to be, right? But I'm going to tell you something. I love, I've been a part of her journey. She's been in our life group. Her parents have been in my life group. I've been a part of her journey. And I have seen, listen, I'm, I, and I'm being 100% serious. I have seen you grow up. And it makes me proud. And this church is proud of you. You make this church proud when you do stuff like that. Great job. Proud of you. I want you to take your Bibles, turn to the book of Romans this morning. We'll continue that study. And um, somebody said, are we ever going to get any good news 
from Romans. In chapter 8, we will. We're just not there yet. Uh, also, as you were coming in, or if you didn't see them as you're going out, there's a voter guide back there. If you want to know what the certain uh, different ones that are being elected this year or that are up for election, and you want to know what they stand for on several of the issues, uh, Joe Biden, Donald Trump, uh, John Ossoff, David Perdue, boy, I need some glasses, Rafe, uh, Raphael <laughs> Warnock, uh, Kelly Loeffler, Doug Collins, Matt Lieberman. Let me just tell you something. These are just straight facts about what they stand on, what their beliefs are, and that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of times when you get into a voting booth, you're thinking, oh, I don't know what that's all about. Do your homework. Do your homework. Uh, you say, well, do you think my vote counts? Yeah, as much as any of them. So uh, when, you, when the president that we are electing walks into the voting booth as well, you know that every vote's got to count. Here's the thing. The people of God need to step up and be known for, for your standards, for your convictions, and, uh, and you need to vote according to the Word of God. Amen. Man, okay, so uh, if you haven't voted yet, um, take you a Snickers, because they say you're gonna, if, you need a, if you're going to be there a long time, get a Snickers, so get a Snickers, all right? If you've already early voted, bless your heart. If you haven't, get a Snickers, that's all I'm going to say. I was riding through uh, the metro Atlanta area, and it's not the same as it is here, I know that, but I was riding through the metro area this past week, and they were the last day of early voting, and there was a line, I'm telling you, 100 yards long. I'm thinking, thank God for the rural area, amen? So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, anyway, just wanted to share that with you, make sure that you vote, and uh, God help you if you're not registered to vote, I won't even go into that, but uh, it, it said this way, if you don't vote, then you have no right to say anything about who gets elected. Book of Romans, chapter 7. You can be seated this morning because I'm going to read it out of two different versions. I'm going to read it out of the New King James that I normally read out of, and then I'm going to also read it out of uh, another version because I just as I, as I came across that, it was just like, wow, that, that kind of opens up some things. And so um, I, want to, I want to make sure that you kind of get the whole wording of that. So there's a lot of Scripture involved in this. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to share a lot of Scripture. And so I hope you have, I hope you have a, uh, a copy of God's Word, if you don't, your, your phone or something, and then everything will be on the screen that, that I'm reading. Begin with Romans chapter 7, begin, uh, Romans 7, verse 14, if you have it, say amen. amen. For, now, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Can you say amen? If then, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Isn't that something? We know there's a problem, but our hardest part with the problem is how in the world do we start acting different? Amen? That's just tough, isn't it? Um, and maybe y'all have it figured out, so y'all pray for me that I'll get it figured out one day. Verse, two, verse 20, now if I do what I will to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, that one who wills, is, uh, one who wills to do good. Now I want to tell you something before we go any further. You're going to read this, and you're going to have to read it four or five times, because if you're not careful, it almost, it almost kind of is a tongue twister. And so what I have to do sometimes, I have to take scripture and kind of break it down write it on a piece of paper and just make sure that I'm not fall, falling over myself. Have y'all ever done that? Or what's our, our tendency time? Sometimes we read the scripture. I don't understand it. Oh, I got to go to something easier now. Where's John at? Where's James at? Let me give me some of that. This is just too, this is too, too crazy for me. Look at verse 21. I find in a law that is that evil is present within me. The one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring. Wow against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. I will wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now I want to show you the comparison of another version. And uh, you say, you, why don't you tell what version it is? I'll be honest with you, I don't remember, all right? I didn't write it in my notes. So it's not the King James or the New King James, but it's another one. How about that? And somebody can go on a search today and say, I found it. Well, great. 
Here's verse, six, verse 14 in this. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual. Look at this. But I am not. Isn't this, all, isn't this, isn't this also your experience? Yes, I am full of myself, after all. I spent a long time in sin's prison. How many would, would just raise your hand and say, sometimes I'm just full of myself? Yeah, we don't like to admit it, but we are. Verse 15, what I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely hate or despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But, in need, but I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best, in, my best intentions, I obviously need help. Anybody in here besides me need some help? Say amen if you need some help. Amen. Verse 18, I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it but I can't do it. I almost titled the message, that, that sentence right there. I can will it, but I can't do it. Wow. Man, I read that and I, th I, I thought, pray, that's it. That's all I need to read right there. I can will it, but I can't do it. Verse 19, I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then <laughs> I do it anyway. Wow. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me. Look at this. Not one time. What does it say? Every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel. And just when, it, when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Verse 25. The answer, thank God, here it is. The answer, thank God, is what? Is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Can I get a witness that anybody is in that same circle with your pastor this morning? Wow. Man, we struggle, don't we? We tell people, say, hey, getting saved is the easiest thing you'll ever do. Living it will be the hardest thing you ever do. Doing it right. According to the scriptures. Let's pray together. Father, I'm thankful that I have the opportunity to be here today at Pleasant Grove. Lord, you've given me such a, so, give me such a life here, and I'm so thankful for that. Thankful for my friends and my family. And I think, Lord, we all agree in this one room, there's nobody on top of, spiritually on top of someone else as far as how they act. We all are in trouble. And Lord, if the apostle Paul was in trouble, surely we could might get a little encouraged at the fact, that, hey, there's hope for us. Lord, we need you. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say it like this, Lord, I need you. I need you every hour of every day, every second of my life. But, Lord, I don't want to just take that and say, well, I got just a license to sin now. No, I want to take that and realize, Lord, this perfection is still, is still the standard. But I must need your help. I'm, I need your help more and more to, every day than I've ever needed in my life. So go with us right now, Father, and I pray that what we do pleases you. And I pray we would not be too full of ourselves. We'd realize, Lord, we're a work in progress and we need each other. We need you. We need help. Go with us right now. In Jesus' name, if you can say amen to this, say amen. amen. I want you to think about, how many of you ever heard this, this statement? Practice makes perfect. Say amen. amen. Not true. Practice makes permanent. You practice bad, you're going to be bad. You practice good, you practice perfect practice, you're going to, maybe that is the case, but practice makes permanent. What you continue to do over and over and over and over again will be what you do habitually over and over and over again. 
You say, well, I'm a Christian. I wouldn't do that anymore. Let me tell you something. Your new nature, the, the, the enemy's always going to be knocking at the door. You can send one of two natures to that door to open it up. And I can promise you the one that you're the strongest will be the one that gets off the couch first and opens the door. Whatever you feed will become the strongest. Are y'all just, are y'all wish I'd get through? Or are y'all just saying, boy, he's on, the, he's hitting a nail today. Are you, just say amen if, it, just say amen if we're on the same page. Amen. Okay. I want to set the table for something. I, I don't want to continue to allow this to be our subject matter every week since March the 15th of 2020. But I'm going to say something today in the beginning of our message that may sound a little bit of uh, uncaring. Hard for you to believe, I understand. But I want to say it because I care for us as a body. So I want you to listen to me. I may just read what I have written because I want to make sure I don't jumble things up. I want to set the table for where we're going this morning. I believe that there are some legitimate cases of the coronavirus still around. So I'm not talking to them. If you're at home and listening and there's some serious or some certain circumstances of the reason you have to be there, then thanks for tuning in. This is not for you. This, this statement I'm about to make. But I believe that we can wallow in what is in front of us long enough that we're literally where it becomes the new normal in our life and we do not even know what normal actually is anymore. There are many that have no reason to sit at home on Sunday other than the fact that they have gotten used to it and they like church in the pajamas and coffee more than they like having to take a shower and come to God's house. It's more comfortable. And contrary to what I may think, there's a new normal in our society now. So with that said, I want to thank you <laughs> for listening in, but there is a new normal whether we like it or not, there is a new normal that's in front of us. You see that every church you go to, don't you, Steve? Steve Ferguson, his wife, man, it's great to see you guys today, our social missionary. But my goal is not to put anybody at risk in this church or in this area. But my goal is to make sure that you're growing in Christ and that I can continue to feed you the Word of God. Whether I have to do it in person, whether I have to do it online, however I have to do it, I've got my preference by however I have to do it. However, I know that in my life over the last seven months, I have been through countless emotions. Some days have been good and some days not so good. Anybody would say amen to that. Amen. Mm -hmm. so, I want, so I want you to answer the question. I don't want you to answer out loud. I want you to answer this question in your mind. Now, here it is. Are you personally... Growing in Christ. If you are, praise God. If you're not, then you've got to find a way to get out of this ditch, out of this plateau, out of these doldrums and say, Lord, I know that you expect me to grow in righteousness, what the scripture says. So how in the world do I do it? I'm just going to start doing better. You ain't good enough. <laughs> just to encourage you, you're not good enough. And neither am I. See, the scripture speaks very clear to us today on the subject of not doing what we should and doing what we shouldn't. And I want to boldly say at this time for the church to rise up. It's time to step up and quit bowing behind all of the things, the agendas that are placed in front of us. And it is time that the people of God would step up and say, listen, I want to be discipled. I want to reach my lost friends. I am tired of using the excuses over and over again about why I can't do something. And it is time for those things to actually get done. If you believe that, say amen to the Lord Jesus this morning. So there are many that think that since we are saved by grace, we can go out and do whatever we want to. We've got a license. But you know what? That's not the person who's died to their sin and is wanting a new life in Christ. That's not the, that's not the, that's not the mindset of that person. You know, when we talk about the law, and I want to make sure you understand, if you're kind of a new believer and you say, I don't understand the law, the grace, all that stuff, let, let, me, let me help you with it. 
the Old Testament, we had a lot of laws and rules, and, and we had, uh, these, are, these are the lines, and you stay in them, you're considered spiritual, godly, whatever. Well, today we kind of have some of those. Church attendance, all those things that people think are so important. And listen, they are not, I'm not denying that the fact they are important. But I want you to know something, more rules won't make you more righteous. Won't do it. I've tried to live by rules. I have a sin in my life, a besetting sin in my life that I struggle with, and I keep struggling and keep struggling. I say, you know what? I'm going to read the Bible more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to, I'm going to. Those things are all good in themselves, but understand, it's not the nature of the law to change your life. It's the nature of a risen Savior that will change your life. Oh, I need to come to church more. I need to, be in a, I need to be in a small group. Listen, that's all well and good. But the nature is what we want to get to, not the outside circumstance, the nature in your life. Years ago, we had senior adults that sat up in there. And I know that many of them can't be here. I'm thankful to those that can and those that are listening online. Well, we asked this question. If you've been saved over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, they kept standing, standing, standing. And the, and the question... It's not a really a good theological question, but when I ask it, you'll understand. I said, how did you stay saved 60 years? Now, we know that we're not in charge of staying saved, according to the Word of God. Thank God for grace. But they answered with this. We learned very early on to trust in God. And I believe with all my heart, not that you can't get saved today like you get saved back then, but listen to me, there's a lot of stuff that flows off the tongue real good, a lot of stuff that sells a lot of books, a lot of stuff that gets a lot of people to watch and come out to a crusade. A lot of things happen like that. Let me tell you something. The only way that your nature will be changed is that the Spirit of God creates a yearning and a, and a conviction in your life, and the Holy Spirit opens up your life and says, hey, this is the way you come to Christ. You denounce everything and come to God. That's what will change your life. But all this stuff of, hey, me and the family joined the church. Well, yeah, Bobby's getting baptized. Bobby got wet if he's not been drawn by the Holy Spirit. So when we talk about the law, I want you to kind of put it in today's terms. The law was the Old Testament law of which we were under. Thank God Jesus came and was baptized and he was, gave his life on the cross. Uh, he was baptized to identify with us. He, was, he, he died on the cross. He was placed in the tomb, raised the third day. And because of his resurrection, listen, we can have new life in Christ. According to Romans chapter 6, we just read it last week. So what are some of the, the characteristics of the law? Number one, what's the authority of the law? Well, Scripture tells us we died to the law. Secondly, Scripture tells us we're delivered from the law. My daddy would say one time, he said, Now, son, at this house, this is the Pritchett house, we have rules. Barney Five said we have two rules. First rule, obey all rules. Second rule, do not write on the wall, or it's very hard to get writing off the wall. Two rules. That is very simple, isn't it? Can I tell you what the rules are for the child of God? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Wow. Chris, there's a lot more in there than that. Oh, yeah. There sure is. But let me tell you something. When you invite Christ into your life and you become a new creation, here's what's going to happen. You're not going to know. It's going to be kind of odd to you. Why am I making the decisions now that I've never made before? Why do I say this now? I've never said that before. Because when Jesus comes into your life, there is a new nature in your life. You don't talk the same. You don't walk the same. You don't look the same. Why? Because God changes everything. God is the only thing that can change your life. Only thing that can change your life. Here's the second thing. There's a ministry of the law. Scripture tells it, it the law reveals sin. The law wakes sin up. The law kills. The law shows sinfulness. It literally, you know, we were on the highway the other day. Denise is not in here, is she? Thank God. She drives because it's better for our marriage. 
no exaggeration. We don't fight nowhere near as much. Used to, the fights were in the car. I'm driving, she didn't like it. Well, this, and I'm usually pretty cool about her driving. We die, I'm going to heaven, that's just pretty much it. <laughs> Everything's fine until you bring the law into the picture. See, we were fine riding with the, with the, with the speed of traffic until she wanted to pass somebody that was in her way. So I look up as we pass this person in a blur, and we're running 85. Well, it would have been fine if we'd have got around them and put on the brakes, but no, we ran 85 for a while until I brought the law up. Honey, you're running 85. I had to pass the guy. I said, yeah, 12 miles ago you passed that guy. <laughs> So I'm going to give you a few things that the law cannot do. Here's number one. Number one, the law cannot change you. Look at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. See, our old nature is flesh. Anytime you hear people talk about my flesh, you're talking about the old nature. You're talking about that old sorry, good for nothing, just old, just, just think wrong, do wrong, practice wrong, old nature. Somebody said, Chris, I'll be honest with you, I felt like, and let me ask you, I want you to raise your hand if it's true in your life. And sometimes, how many of you would say, honestly, I feel like I've sinned more now that I'm supposedly saved than I did before I got saved? Raise your hand if that's you. Well, y'all need help. <laughs> and I've worried about that and worried about that and worried about that all my life. And you've heard me say this before. But I want to give it to you in context of this message. Here it is. My nature, with that new nature, is more aware of how the old nature looks. And when the new nature, and I'm walking in the spirit, and uh, supposedly I'm walking in the spirit, and I do something, say something or whatever that is contrary to the new nature, to my righteousness, to the righteousness of God, guess what's going to happen? That alarm goes off, and it seems like the alarm goes off all the time. Can I tell you why? Because before I didn't have a new nature, and sin was not awake. But when the Spirit of God came into my life, He awoke the sin in my life. There's a place called the Autobahn. Everybody knows if you know what that is. That's a, that's, a, that's a highway somewhere not here. And it's an unlimited speed limit. I would love to go one time by myself and just hammer down. I'd like to take, jo I'd like to take Jeff's Corvette. No strings attached. <laughs> Said, everybody come back. I may not. <laughs> Some of you are thinking right there, Jesus help us, all right. I love this statement. I read it out of Warren Wiersbe's commentary. I think you'll like it. The old nature knows no law. The new nature needs no law. See, when you're walking with Jesus, and is this such good, is this good stuff, y'all? I love, I'm loving this. If y'all ain't, I'm having a ball. I'm thinking, this is, this is, so, this is so freeing because I'm thinking, wow, now I know why I'm in such a mess. Now I know why I'm always messing up. The things that I, well, I, I'll get that in a minute. Let's go for it. <laughs> the law could not transform the old nature. It can only reveal how sinful that old nature really is. The believer that tries to live under the law will only activate sin in their life. The law is kind, the law is kind of like the person who always has a problem but never offers a solution. He reveals that here's the problem, but he never gives you instruction about how do I fix such the, the mess that I'm in. And I love what Scripture says. That's where Jesus comes in. I want to make sure that none of you forget this, but none of you are, have a chance without the Lord Jesus. You ain't got a chance. Oh, I hear old so-and-so's off the pipe now. I hear so-and-so, he's not drinking anymore, doing a lot better. Well, if old so-and-so hadn't turned his life over to Jesus, he'll be back on it before long. This is what Scripture says. He said, well, I, preacher, I, I am so thankful 
I don't even have to read that Old Testament anymore. Thank God we're not under the law. Let me help you with that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 says this. Do not think that I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I came to fulfill the law. Listen, there's only one way that you're going to do right. And it's not going to be because uh, there's a bunch, of, bunch more rules. That's what our government does. Hey, let's get some more laws. That way people act right. No, the reason people are shooting up schools is because of their rotten, sinful nature, not because we got too many guns. Lord, help. Y'all messed up. Here's the second thing the law cannot do. The law cannot enable you to do good. Yeah, people say, pass the law. Just pass a law. Pass one, pass two, pass something, but pass a law. I have been offended. Get in line. What was that, the church? Get in two lines. See, it can show you your mistakes, but only a new life in Christ can give you the ability and the power to be able to do, be different and even give you a chance to fulfill the law. Now, I want to make sure you know who's talking here. This is Paul. Wrote three-fourths of the New Testament, and much of it from a jail cell. He was never married. Somebody said, that's exactly why he had time to write. (laughs) Isn't that what you told me to say it, Jeff? I I didn't... (laughs) But Paul... Is the one, now listen, I'll be honest with you, it's hard sometimes when you're talking about the Apostle Paul so much, you kind of you you put so much emphasis on him instead of the Lord Jesus. You got to be careful of that because he's a sinner just like us. But this guy walked with God. This guy literally wrote New Testament. Many times in the, in the book Corinthians, you'll see, I, not the Lord, or the Lord, not me. He's saying that the Lord's not saying this, I'm saying this. And when he came in, he began to give the gospel after he was uh, saved in the book of Acts. Man, he just went. He was so on fire for the enemy before salvation. And then, man, when God got a hold of his heart, and he met somebody named Barnabas that was an encourager in his life and gave him some credibility to walk into the synagogue. Can I tell you that every every one of you need a Barnabas in your life? In fact, if you've got one, you need to be a Barnabas in somebody else's life. You know, um, we always fall short. We've been talking about that. But every time we want to please God, every time we make God a promise, we seem to fall short. So I look at Paul's life and I'm thinking, wow, there's hope for Chris Pritchett. There's hope. This is the guy That son, I'm talking about when he walked and preached, he preached preached so long one night that they they fell asleep on him. So next time y'all complain about a 40-minute sermon, I'm going to take you to that scripture, okay? So since we're such sinners and we can personalize, let me give you some problems that we have. Number one, look at my problem. Look at verse 15. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, That I do not practice, but what I hate, look what it says, that I what? That I do. The thing I detest, the thing that I hate, the thing that I said I would never do is the very thing I do. I would never talk about somebody like that. I would never do that. I would never do this. And the very thing I said I wasn't going to do is the very thing that I'm doing. Well, I got problems. How many of you say, man, I got problems? Say, man, if you got problems. There's three of you. Okay, look at, look at the second one. Not only my problems, but look at my performance. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, remember our old nature, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform, the word perform means to accomplish what is good I do not find. Here's what he's saying. How many of you ever heard this? I know you have. Many people start out good, but they don't finish well. That's what that scripture is actually talking about. Man, when I got saved and I stood up here and the church came by and they gave me the right hand of fellowship and I called home and everybody was high-fiving me. They put it on Facebook. Then I got in the baptistry. All the aunts and uncles came. We went to eat at Mexican restaurant. We went home. Everything's good. And about three months later, we're back to normal again. My performance, I didn't last long. 
I've had some people in my life, even in this church, and I learned, I've learned, really, I have. And it's still, I still struggle with this because I, listen, y'all, I'm not saying this to get any reaction. I just want to say, I'm the kind of guy that I want everybody to play. If there's 15 people picked for the, pick for the for kickball, kickball team, well, I'm going to be on the team that's got less than, one, less than the rest of them. I just, I, just, I, I just don't want anybody left out. But you know what I do find is this. As much as I want out of people, I can sit here and I can encourage and encourage and encourage and encourage. And I'm going to say this, but I'm not saying this to embarrass her because I really am proud of Malia. Oh, my gosh. I know, Mom and Dad, you are proud of Malia. I, I'm totally proud of Malia. I am. I saw that on Facebook, and I was like, holy cow, I love that. But I say this with all the love in my heart, and I'm going to make sure you understand this. And, Malia, I hope you're listening. Somebody says, well, how do you know that Malia is going to continue to do right? Maybe you ought to wait a little while. Sat. Oh, my gosh, can you imagine? Can you imagine if the church started taking votes on if you walked in the door if you were going to last or not? There's some that do. And if the votes were out, listen, I've been walking with God 36 years, and there's been more times I feel like that I didn't make it last than that I did. But every one of us, are in charge of our own decisions, 100%. We can't say, well, no, that's somebody else's decision, not mine. Oh, no, 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 it's yours. I have no doubt God's doing a work in your life, and I'm thankful for you. Really am. Not only my problems or my performance, I want you to look at my practice. This word has haunted me for several years. Look what it says. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. How many of you have left church and a sermon's been preached or a Bible study's been taught and you walk out the door before you ever get out of here or in this altar, you made a promise to the Lord and said, hey, from this day forward, I'm going to walk with you. How many of you have made that promise at some point in time in your life? I mean, we probably all have one point in our life. Only for it to last no further than the car once we got out of the driveway. Yeah. So look what he says in the scripture, verse 19. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. Look at this next part. But the evil I will to do, that I, look what that word says. Look what it says. What does it say? Say it out loud. Practice. Practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. So the good that I know to do, I don't do it. But the evil that I know not to do, that's what I practice. You encouraged now? See, Paul shares three lessons that he learned. And I'm just going to do it quickly because I want to finish up. Three lessons that he learned that the, that the law cannot do. Number one, knowledge of rules is not the answer to your problem. You can, you can quote the Ten Commandments. You can know what Scripture says about all these issues. But you still have to make a choice of what you're going to do about what you already know. Here's the second thing. Self-determination doesn't succeed. I am determined. Ain't nothing going to stop me now. See, many times we have people that only have an old nature that are trying to please God without a new nature. And the third thing is becoming a Christian doesn't stamp out all the temptation in a person's life. If that was true, Jesus wouldn't have been tempted himself. I told you there's a lot of scripture, and I want to read this, this passage to you, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, talking about it's a journey. Some of you, when you got saved, you promised God everything. But it's a race, not a sprint. <laughs> I remember I ran the peach tree one time. I've been in the peach tree a bunch of times. I've ran it one time, all 6.2, get you some of that. Well, yeah, I got a T-shirt. Been there, done that, got a T-shirt, right? Went to watch Russ it's several years after that. He ran a marathon. I don't know what 
possessed him to do such, but he did. And so we were going to catch up with him in kind of the middle of the race, and the guy at the stoplight, he said, they're coming through, and here's what he said, you can catch them at mile 16. I thought, 16? What? And they were still running at mile 16. I'm going to take a chance here without opening up a can of worms. How do you keep running at mile 16? Huh? A big dog. A big dog. <laughs> I said I didn't want to open up a can of worms, and there it went. It's on the floor now. How do you run? How are you still running at 16? So who said what that? Training. Training. Somebody else said something else over here. Endurance. Training. Duck builds. What's, what's something about one more? Huh? One more. Ooh, I like that, brother. I like it. Goes back to when I asked the senior adults, how do you stay safe 60 years? Hey, it's a one day. One of them said one day at a time. One day at a time. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, do, not, do, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? Look at this. But one receives the prize. Hey, can I tell you something? In God's, in God's math, not everybody gets a trophy. I'm sorry. Everybody won't get a trophy in heaven. You'll get a crown. But you won't, you won't get all in jewels just because you showed up. Well, I know I hurt some of you's feelings right there, but... Look at verse 25. And everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we, what does it say? For an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Can I tell you what the word uncertainty means? And I don't want to just bore you with all these, all these what word means. But here's what the word certainty means. Uncertainty means. It means to run in circles. You ever felt like you're living your life in circles? See, you may be running. You may be sweating. You may be in shape, but you're going nowhere. And I know a lot of people that name Christ as the head of their life, but they're going nowhere. Second Timothy 4 says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. So, Paul had a problem with self, and I have a problem with self. Four things that uh, stand in my way. I'll give them to you. I'm not going to explain them. Some of you have been to SOU may sound familiar to this. Four things. My carnal self is one of them. I'm my own worst enemy. My circumstances. Circumstances are things that get in my way. The crowd. Who am I hanging with? The criticism, every one of you going to have critics. See, the people that buried me forgot to know that I was a seed. And then when they buried me, I was meant to die so that I could raise and walk in the newness of life. So you got critics in your life? Get in line. You're going to have them all your life. Oh, I don't like my job because of my boss. I don't like playing this sport because of my coach. Listen, you are going to have dirt poured on you all your life. Just understand that you're a seed. When you die to self, then God raises you to be totally different, totally new. We'd rather have somebody feel sorry for us. The last thing the law can't do, it, the law can't set you free. The Bible says we're at war. There's a war going on in our life. The old nature, the new nature. The Bible even says we're wayward, we're led astray. I did a study, and I want to give you, I don't want to bore you with these things, but this is some, some of the greatest truth that I just read, and I thought, man. And I want you to think about this thought. What difference does an inch make? One inch. What inch difference does one second make? Or one mile an hour make? Or, you know, one degree make? If you started at Washington, D.C., and you went around the earth, one time, and you were off an inch when you started at Washington, D.C., when you got all the way around the earth, when you got back, you'd wind up in Boston, Massachusetts. You're a little off. If you started at Hart County High School and you went one mile, but you were an inch off when you went that one mile, when you got a, when you got a mile away, you'd be 440 feet off, a little over about, a ball, about one and a half football fields. If you went 10 miles, which is at Goldmine Holly Springs Road off of 29, 
from Hartwell High School. That's 10 miles. When you got there, you'd be 440 feet off. When you got to Mid-South Cage, where your Scoots Rice place is 12 miles away, and you would be exactly one mile off because you started at one inch off. If you got to Athens Tech, in Athens, right at the crossroads there, the main crossroads where Kroger and all that stuff is, that's 38 miles away from Hart County High School. And when you got there, if you started off at one inch off, you would be 3.1 miles off course. If you said, I'm going to go to Seattle, Washington, all the way across the United States. Well, if you got to Seattle, Washington, you were an inch off when you started in Hartwell, you'd wind up in the Pacific Ocean. Some of you are baseball fans, and baseball just ended. And you know the name of Aldous Chapman. He's the closer for the New York Yankees. He throws regularly over 100 miles an hour. The difference between his 100-mile-an-hour fastball and an 80-mile-an-hour changeup or an average high school pitcher that throws about 80 miles an hour, the difference between those two is 0 0.10 second, one-tenth of a second in those two pitches. We're talking about a high school pitcher and one of the pros that can throw it faster than anybody. We're talking about one-tenth of a second. A 4.740. At a football combine, a 4740. And the difference between that and a 5.040, one tenth of a mile an hour. No, excuse me, one mile an hour. A 4740 is 17 miles an hour. A 5040 is 16 miles an hour. Chris, why are you telling us all these numbers? Because here's what I want you to know. It don't take but that far to get off course. And, you're, and you can't understand why in the world did I wind up here? I had such desire, aspirations, goals, and dreams to go there. But now I wind up over here because, let me tell you something, sin in your life is just very small. Very little. Very little. And Stacy, you can come and I'll give you this last word. Scripture says in verse 24, O wretched man that I am. The word wretched literally means that I'm miserable. Can I tell you? That if you are saved, if you know that you know that you know that you've invited Christ into your life, and you know that if you died, you go to heaven. But you know that you're wayward right now. You know that, man, your life's not, it's just not where it ought to be with the Lord. Scripture calls you wretched because here's what it means. Literally, the word wayward, being wretched, you are miserable because you know what truth is, but you're not living by it. I don't know about you, but my, all, probably all of us have gotten off course. All of us have said, you know what? Man, if I'm a Christian, you couldn't tell it by my actions. And I'm going to tell you, during this time right now, it is real easy just to kind of take the, take the easy route. It's easy. He sees that, you know what, everybody else is here, everybody else is doing this. But you'll only live the, the Christian life, the victorious Christian life, intentionally. You won't be righteous in spite of you. Oh, yeah, we wear the righteousness of God. But if you want to do things God's way, it's going to be because you lined up and said, Lord, this is going to hurt. This is going to bruise me. This is going to make me, this, hey, this is going to make me have some, uh, I'm going to lose some friends. Lord, I want to please you more, please you more than anything else. I'm going to tell you, when you're on a journey with God, there's a lot of bumps and bruises, a lot. You say, well, Chris, how do I fix that? How do I get out of this mess? How do I, how do, I do that? This is our invitation. I want you to listen to it. Here's your instruction. You've given us all kinds of problems, but how in the world do I turn it? How do I turn around and, and walk this way? How do I do this? Here's number one. It's an idea found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Let us lay aside every weight. Lay aside, it means to take it off, like taking off a jacket. Let me take it off. 
that may include that you got to remove some people on your friend list whatever the case may be but lay it aside every weight the hindrances in our life see I don't have to tell you what's hindering your life you know what's hindering your life you know I don't have to tell you that the preacher can here and say oh, I didn't, he didn't speak to me today he wasn't supposed to but the Holy Spirit probably did see the preacher doesn't know you but the Holy Spirit knows you it's the same word intimately knows you What are we laying aside? The sin which so easily ensnares us. The word ensnare means the same thing. It's uncertain. Going in all different directions. See, if we listen to all kind of stuff, it'll have us going around in circles too. You got us going and say, oh my Lord. I don't even know. Have you ever thought, I don't even know what right is anymore. Yeah, that's that, that's that uncertain, that's an ensnared. But the good news is we're running a race and a marathon, not a sprint. When you realize, hey man, I've blown it. Oh man, I've blown it. Then he says, let us run. It either leads things to be run or to walk hastily. <laughs> so some of you that can't run anymore, but you can walk hastily. If you can't do that, get a dog. That's what Robert said. He says, run the course with endurance. I think Amanda said that. Word endurance, endurance means patience. I love the, another definition, it means hopeful. Hopeful. You know, there is, there is nobody... So much in trouble as somebody who doesn't have hope. Hope. Maybe hope was out of your life and then somebody gave you a hand out, hand up, whatever it was. And you said, man, for the first time in my life, I got some hope. Run with endurance, the race. And this race in the book of Hebrews means hardship. So the race you're running, hardship. The last thing I'll share with you is that, that is set before us. I've shared this before, and this is it, I promise. I, I could preach all day. That, that Romans is just so full of food. It's just unbelievable. Several years ago, John and I hunted on the same property. We still do from time to time, but I don't know if he was wanting an extra couple of days off, but he went over there and he... He cut down trees and everything so I could get to my stand between a bunch of pine trees. Well, it won him some days. He can do anything he wants to as long as he cut all those trees down. I want to get down here, so if you don't have lights, that's fine, but I'm going to get down here where I can talk to y'all. John told me that he went and he had cut down those trees and he had cleared out a path. And he had even taken some ribbon tied around the tree so I could get through. Because, I mean, at that hunting land, when you step out of the truck on that road, you literally, the, the pines are like this. You can't see. But on the other side of those pines is a bunch of hardwoods where, man, the deer love the acorns and stuff like that. And if you can get through those pines, man, you, you, can see, you can see some good deer. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm moving too much. Sorry. When I got out of the truck and walked up the old dirt road, I got to where John told me that he had gone in the woods. And I looked in the woods and hanging on the tree was a piece of orange ribbon. You know, the kind like, what do they call it, survey tape, landscape tape, whatever it is. And a thought hit me. Survey ribbon doesn't grow on trees. Somebody's been here. This must be where John told me about. So I stepped into the woods. I saw that first piece of tape. And I looked. I thought, there's another one. I went to the next one. There's another one. There's another one. Before I knew it, I was through the pines. I was in the oaks. I was where my stand needed to be. I said, Chris, what are you saying? 
I'm saying that the, the, the walk and the journey that God wants you on, he's already been there. He's already cleaned you out of the path. He's already marked it by his word. All we have to do is trust that the ribbons are there. What are the ribbons? Truths, experiences, circumstances that have grown our life. We step into those woods and think, oh, yeah, I remember that one. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. And before long, I was in the, I was in the hardwoods. Why? Because somebody had gone before me and plotted out the course. Verse 1 of chapter 12 of Hebrews that I didn't read says this, since we, are such, since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. Here's what it means. You read chapter 11 in the book of Hebrews, you'll see numerous people have gone before us. And we have scripture today that spells out how we walk with God. If we'll just trust it, read it, and obey it. Some of you are on a journey this morning. Some of you, you're on a faith journey that you've met the Lord and you don't really know what to do. Maybe you got saved right before the shutdown. And for seven months, you feel like you've been wandering in the wilderness. And I'm, I want to be honest with you, for 36 years, I've tried to walk with the Lord, but in seven months, I felt like I've been in the wilderness. But you can't, leave, you can't live there. You can't stay there. But I want you to know that as a believer, when you responded to the drawing of the Holy Spirit, you begin to follow him. Everything he tells you to do, you can back it up with this book right here. And when you see it in here, you can trust that he's already been in the pines and he's already cut down all the obstacles and he's given you a path and he's already gone where he wants you to go. He's already gone, came back and got you and now he wants you to follow him to go there again. And we can trust him. We can flat trust God. Nothing about our world looks the same as it did eight months ago. Nothing. But that's okay. That's okay. Don't hang your head and think, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? We're going to realize that God is the God of every single day of our life. And we can trust him. We can trust him. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're a brand new Christian... These are the most exciting days of your life because right now he is teaching you how to trust him. You got kids? Oh, they need to see you trusting God. They need to see you walking with God. They need to see dads and moms literally standing up and saying, listen, guys, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we're going to trust God today. As Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I can't answer more than that. We're going to serve the Lord. My dad used to take a, pen, a penny out of his pocket. Flick it like that on the living room floor. He said, you set penny, son? He said, I don't know this one, this house. It's mine. He had Alzheimer's. He didn't know that he owed a lot more than that penny, but I'm just saying. But my dad taught me how to be faithful. Not because he said a bunch of words, but because I watched his life be faithful. Your kids are going to watch your life be faithful. The people in your life are watching you be faithful. He said, Chris, I don't know if I believe all that. That's fine. I understand. That's why it's called faith. But I can tell you this. Somebody said, Chris, prove to me there's a God. I can't. But I can prove to you why I know that there's a God. Because I know what he's done in my life. Would you pray with me all over this room? Very simple this morning. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Here's the invitation. So simple. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ, that's what you need to do. That's so simple. If you're here and you know that you're saved, but you say, Chris, I'll be honest, I'm wayward. I feel like I got an inch off, and I don't know where I'm at now. I'm, I'm off. I know one thing. I'm off track. I can tell you that. I'm off track. Well, as a believer, you know what that feels like. Man, I do. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ, let me tell you something. The reason we opened the doors and the reason we were so apt to get back to church when we were able to get back to church is because 
we realize there's some people that need Jesus. And you're here today because you may be one of them. Listen, it, should, it doesn't surprise any of us in this place who get saved. I don't care if you've been in church all your life. You've never trusted Christ, your Lord and Savior. This would be as great a day as any. And the people that are praying right now, that are from this church, are praying for you. Romans 7, 10, 13 says, For whosoever that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you're a whosoever. I don't care if you're 50, if you're 5, if you're 75. He'll take you just like you are and love you too much to leave you that way. He'll change your life. He'll change your life. Maybe you need to join this fellowship. I don't know. Maybe you're saved and say, man, I want to I be in a place where the word of God is preached, taught. I want to be a part of that. Maybe you've never been baptized. Maybe you need to recommit your life to the Lord. Maybe you've just gotten off track. I don't know what it is. But I'm about to pray. And when I pray, I'll be standing right here. And Josh and John are going to be standing right here beside me. Whatever decision you need to make this morning, if you need to come and just pray with somebody or ask somebody to pray with you, man, we'd love to do that. Well, we're glad you're here this morning. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed right before Stacy sings, you'd be honest and say, Chris, I don't know that I, if I died, I don't know if I would go to heaven. Well, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And he'll take you just like you are. But he's the only way. So while you're sit, sitting there, you simply say in your heart, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know the only way, the only way I'm ever going to go to heaven is to trust you as my Savior. The only way. So Lord, would you come into my heart? Would you save me, forgive me of my sins, and make me new? Change my life. This morning, if you prayed that prayer to invite Christ into your life, I'm going to ask you when we stand in just a moment to come to one of us three and just say simply four words, I prayed that prayer. We'd love for somebody to sit down and pray with you and make sure you have any questions, make sure you know what, what's going on. But listen, we're not going to grab you. We're not making a big, hey, it's the greatest thing in the world. The reason we open the doors is because God knew you'd be here. So Father, I pray right now that your will be done. Go with us today, Father. May everything we say and do, may I, I pray it has honored you, Lord. Pray that you'd use this time right now. Give us liberty and freedom to move in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Stacy sings one verse unless somebody comes. But if you need somebody to pray with you, you need to make a decision, you come right now as she sings. We'd love to pray.